Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest the world has ever come to nuclear apocalypse. An ever-escalating arms race had led to the deployment of Soviet missiles in Cuba, which were now prepped and ready to fire on Washington, New York, and almost the entire eastern seaboard. An invasion force of over 120,000 soldiers gathered on the shores of Florida, and almost 3,000 American nuclear weapons were locked onto targets across the Soviet Union. The defining event of the Cold War, it would see the world's leading superpowers fight in a dangerous battle for nuclear superiority, just 90 miles from the American coast. For 13 days in October 1962, American President John F. Kennedy and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev would engage in a battle of wills, where one wrong move could lead to global destruction. Time was ticking, and neither side knew how events were about to unfold. By 1962, Cold War tensions were at an all-time high, with disputes won by the side with the biggest nuclear arsenal. The United States had maintained a significant lead in the arms race since the conflict began, and had already installed Jupiter nuclear missiles in Italy and Turkey, all of which were aimed at the Soviet Union. With this advantage, the United States were quickly able to gain the upper hand in any Cold War confrontation, with the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev relying on threats and bluffs to maintain the illusion of control. Things would change in 1959, when communist revolutionary Fidel Castro managed to gain power in Cuba. The communist victory would come as a shock to US officials, as for the last 30 years, Cuba had been a popular holiday destination for wealthy Americans, and by the 1950s, most of the Cuban economy was under American control. However, this would all change when Castro came to power, with American-owned banks, casinos, as well as coffee and sugar plantations, all being nationalized, with Castro eventually turning to the Soviet Union for help and protection. When John F. Kennedy became president in 1961, he was under immense pressure to deal with the Cuban problem, and so launched the Bay of Pigs invasion in April 1961, just four months after taking office. 1,500 CIA-trained Cuban exiles invaded the island, with their task to depose Castro and eliminate communism in Cuba. But the invasion would turn out to be a disaster. The exiles found very little support amongst the Cuban people, and were quickly trapped by Castro's forces. Wanting to hide American involvement, Kennedy refused to sanction US air support, leading to the invaders surrendering after just three days. It was an embarrassing start to Kennedy's presidency. Castro's victory in Cuba was equally as important for Khrushchev. As well as gaining a new ally in the Western Hemisphere, Khrushchev would also develop a deep affection for Castro himself, later stating that he thought of him like a son. Deciding that it was only a matter of time before Kennedy attempted another invasion of Cuba, Khrushchev decided to deploy nuclear missiles to the island in 1962, insisting on complete secrecy. If all went to plan, he would fly to Havana, the capital of Cuba, once the missiles were installed, to announce a formal defense agreement with Castro, forming a united front against the Americans. In order to maintain complete secrecy, the Soviet troops sent to the island were crammed beneath the deck of cargo and transport ships, where there was barely enough space to lie down. The soldiers themselves had no idea where they were heading, and were told to wear civilian clothes once they arrived to avoid detection. Accompanying the transport ships were four Soviet submarines, each of which carried a small nuclear-tipped torpedo. But conditions on the submarines were even worse than on the transport ships. As the submarines entered tropical waters, each 78-man crew would have to deal with temperatures as high as 140 degrees Fahrenheit, or 60 degrees Celsius. The crews suffered from extreme dehydration and nausea, made worse by the dangerously high levels of carbon dioxide and the constant smell of diesel. But for now, they had managed to avoid US intelligence, and Khrushchev's great missile gamble was looking successful. They would learn, Khrushchev stated, 
just what it feels like to have enemy missiles pointing at you. We'd be doing nothing more than giving them a little taste of their own medicine. It would take over a month for American U-2 spy planes to first spot the missiles. On October 16th, the CIA would present Kennedy with a series of photographs of the unfinished missile sites, with important elements labelled for easy identification. It was soon determined that they were dealing with medium-range ballistic missiles, capable of hitting targets at a distance of almost 1,200 miles. Launched from Cuba, they would be capable of delivering a nuclear strike on Florida, New York, and even the nation's capital, Washington DC, in just 13 minutes, causing millions of civilian casualties. To help guide him through the crisis, Kennedy would set up XCOM, a group of his most influential and trusted advisors. As the group debated, it soon became clear that Kennedy had two options open to him. He could either set up a naval blockade around Cuba to prevent further Soviet shipments from arriving, or he could use airstrikes to take out the missile sites before they could be completed. After days of debate, Kennedy would decide that the blockade was the better option. It was far less likely to provoke a conflict and would open the way for negotiation. On October 22nd, over a hundred million Americans would tune into the television and watch Kennedy announce the discovery of the missiles and his plans to implement a naval blockade of Cuba. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Almost 5,000 miles across the world, Khrushchev was deciding how to respond to Kennedy's announcement. He was glad that the president had shown restraint and had decided not to invade. The Soviet soldiers stationed in Cuba were equipped with short-range nuclear missiles to use in the event of a US invasion. If Kennedy had decided to invade, a full-scale nuclear war would have almost certainly followed. With Kennedy implementing a naval blockade of Cuba, Khrushchev now had to decide what to do with the Soviet ships still at sea. While almost all of the first shipments had arrived in Cuba, a more powerful group of intermediate-range missiles was still halfway across the Atlantic. He could either back down now and face an embarrassing retreat, or call the Americans bluff and continue to push ahead. As Khrushchev debated the issue, panic would begin to spread in the United States. The stock exchange was tanking, and many shops suddenly found themselves emptied out in a wave of panic buying. People could only sit at home and watch as news came in of Soviet ships creeping closer and closer to the blockade. Finally, on the morning of October 24th, two days after Kennedy's announcement, news would come in that the first Soviet ship had turned around and began sailing back home. Kennedy's gamble had paid off there would be no more Soviet missiles arriving in Cuba. Upon hearing the news, Secretary of State Dean Rusk would famously state, we're eyeball to eyeball, and I think the other fellow just blinked. But the crisis would continue. As the missile sites neared completion, each side would begin to prepare for war. The Strategic Air Command would move to DEFCON 2 for the first time in history, just one step short of nuclear war. It commanded almost 3,000 nuclear weapons and had a B-52 Stratofortress taking off from US air bases every 20 minutes, each carrying enough destructive power to take out four Soviet cities. <laughs> 
The US invasion plan of Cuba was also nearing completion, with top generals pressuring Kennedy to authorize the attack. Codenamed Operation Scabbards, the invasion called for a series of massive airstrikes, followed by a paratrooper drop and an amphibious landing of 120,000 troops, almost the size of the D-Day landings at the end of World War II. As these troops began to arrive in Florida, the state came to resemble a war zone. Machine gun nests and barbed wire littered the beaches, and armed soldiers patrolled the streets. The Casa Marina Hotel was turned into an army headquarters, and the CIA set up safe houses in the surrounding area, where Cuban exiles were prepared to be used as an infiltration force. War was fast approaching, but on the evening of October 26th, the first signs of a diplomatic solution would appear. Kennedy would receive an unexpected letter from Khrushchev, outlining the potential terms of a deal. If the United States ended the blockade and promised not to invade Cuba, then Khrushchev would be willing to withdraw his troops. But the members of XCOM were skeptical. Many were keen to invade, while others were unwilling to accept any compromise that could be seen as a sign of weakness. Negotiation would have to wait. The crisis would come to a head on October 27, 1962, a day that would come to be known as Black Saturday. On this day, a series of incredibly dangerous events would take place, any one of which could have led to a nuclear war. The day would begin with Castro composing a letter to Khrushchev, urging him to consider a nuclear first strike against the United States. He had become utterly convinced that an American invasion was imminent, and wanted his Soviet allies to deliver the first blow. Unlike Castro, Khrushchev still believed there was time for negotiation. He would send a second proposal to Kennedy, this time specifying what he would accept in a deal. Khrushchev agreed to remove his missiles from Cuba, if Kennedy would do the same with the American Jupiter missiles in Turkey. Wanting to bypass the slow diplomatic process, Khrushchev would instead broadcast his message over Radio Moscow for the world to hear. When Kennedy heard the proposal, he knew it was a fair deal. The Jupiter missiles were secretly considered obsolete, with Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara describing them as a pile of junk. Yet there was significant resistance within XCOM. The Turkish government was opposed to the deal, and it was argued that trading away the missiles would significantly weaken the power of NATO and lead to further demands from Khrushchev. If Kennedy wanted to accept the deal, he would have to stand alone against his advisers. American spy plane pilot Rudolf Anderson would then enter Cuban airspace. As he began photographing the missile sites, he would draw the attention of Soviet air defenses, who would label him target number 33. The Soviet forces had been in a state of high alert for a number of days, being convinced by Castro that an American invasion was imminent. Anderson's plane was particularly troubling, as it had flown over the missile site targeting Guantanamo Bay. If allowed to leave, the Americans would have in-depth knowledge of Soviet positions, paving the way for targeted airstrikes. Deciding it was too dangerous to let the spy plane escape, the order was dispatched to destroy target number 33. Two missiles were fired, with Anderson being killed upon impact. The crisis had claimed its first casualty. Back in Washington, time was running out. The military were calling for massive airstrikes against Cuba by Monday morning at the latest, and news was starting to come in that Anderson's plane had been shot down. At this crucial moment, Kennedy would turn to the one person he could truly trust, 
his brother, Attorney General Bobby Kennedy. With the help of presidential speechwriter Ted Sorensen, Bobby would draft a reply to Khrushchev that attempted to merge all the different ideas XCOM had. In exchange for the removal of the missiles, the United States would be willing to make a pledge not to invade Cuba. The removal of the Jupiter missiles in Turkey was also part of the deal, but this would have to remain a secret to avoid offending America's NATO allies. Khrushchev would just have to trust that the president would stick to his word. This was Kennedy's last hope. If the deal was rejected, he would have no choice but to go to war. As Bobby was delivering the message to the Soviet ambassador, an incredibly dangerous confrontation would occur in the Atlantic. The US Navy had been making an intense effort to find the four Soviet submarines since the crisis began, and had finally closed in on them. They planned to use signalling depth charges to drive the submarines to the surface, whose harmless explosions would act as a warning. The Soviet submarine B-59 had been chased by US forces for the last two days, with the already unbearable conditions on board having gotten worse. The ventilation system had shut down, with temperatures rising to unbearable heights and high levels of carbon dioxide causing many officers to faint while on duty. The disoriented crew would be shaken by wave after wave of deafening explosions as US ships began dropping signalling depth charges directly on top of them. The submarine's crew had been unable to contact Moscow for over 24 hours, and as far as they were aware, World War III could have broken out while they were under the waves. Tired and exhausted, the submarine's captain would order nuclear torpedoes to be launched, believing that war had already begun. But the decision required the approval of all onboard officers. One of the officers, Vasily Arkhipov, refused to go through with the launch, single-handedly preventing the outbreak of nuclear war. As night came on October 27th, no one knew what the next day would hold. The crisis had claimed its first casualty. A nuclear launch had been narrowly avoided in the Atlantic, and both Fidel Castro and the US military were pressing for war. The power to end the crisis now lay with Khrushchev. He could either swallow his pride and accept Kennedy's terms, or push for further concessions and risk provoking war. But Khrushchev had decided long ago that he would have to retreat. As Kennedy's message came in, promising to remove the Jupiter missiles, Khrushchev finally had terms he could work with, and that morning he would broadcast his acceptance of the deal on Radio Moscow, bringing an end to the crisis. The Soviet forces in Cuba were ordered to dismantle the missiles and return them home, with the last leaving the island two weeks later. The blockade was formally ended on November 20th, with the Jupiter missiles, as promised, being discreetly dismantled five months later. While Kennedy and Khrushchev were both relieved, others were less happy. Castro was furious that a deal had taken place behind his back and would begin to doubt the resolve of his Soviet allies. The US military, who had been pushing for an invasion since the crisis began, were also critical of the deal, with General Curtis LeMay describing the deal as the greatest defeat in American history. The Cuban Missile Crisis would have a significant effect on the Cold War. Having come so close to nuclear apocalypse, both superpowers would take steps to ensure that a similar crisis could never happen. Communication had been particularly poor during the crisis, with Khrushchev's first letter taking almost 12 hours to reach the president. A hotline would soon be installed between the White House and the Kremlin to ensure good communication if another crisis occurred. Never again would the most powerful leaders in the world have to communicate through the sole use of handwritten letters and radio broadcasts. <laughs> 